Combating the Knights of Columbus Using the Sword of the Spirit to Reprove the Knights of Columbus By Scroll Independent Ministries Alright, chapter 13, the final chapter, it's called The Secret Work. Grand Knight addresses them. Brothers, as duly accredited members of the Knights of Columbus, it is your right and duty to become acquainted with the secret work of the Order. The password is important. It admits you to the Council Chamber. It must be kept a secret from all outsiders. The word is changed once a year. For the present year, it is... One password was Knights of Columbus shall rule. Once you come to a council meeting, attract the attention of the outside guard. Whisper in his ear the first half of the password. He will admit you into the anteroom. Rap upon the entrance of the council chamber. The inside guard will open the wicket and you will whisper into his ear the last half of the password. He will then admit you to the council chamber. You will walk to the center of the chamber and salute the captain of the guard with the usual military salute. When he returns the salute, you may take your place among the members of the council. All right. So, um, I should have maybe highlighted this a little bit uh, where it uh, says the grip. The grip is given by shaking hands in an ordinary way and giving two distinct pressures with all the fingers. The answer by one sharp pressure. This is answered by one sharp pressure. The question which goes with the grip is, what council do you belong to? Right. But take a look at that grip. Um, that's a very, very interesting grip that uh, the Knights of Columbus are promoted to you know, and encouraged to use. Okay. Uh, let me read this last paragraph and then, uh, I'll, you'll see what I mean. So brothers, you are now duly accredited members of the Knights of Columbus. You are initiated into the secrets of the order. You may come in and go out as children of one family. I charge you to be faithful to the order, true to your pledge, never reveal our secrets to outsiders. Okay, so secrets are essential to the Knights of Columbus. This is, this is the whole point of the fraternity, uh, to say the least. Okay, whether it's networking or whatnot, it's like, this is one of the main factors of the Knights of Columbus. And no, they're, they're, the secrets are still part of the Knights of Columbus. Okay, this is fellow craft grips and working tools. Okay, grip of a fellow craft. Does that not look very similar? This is from the Scottish Rite Masonry Illustrated. The complete ritual of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite profusely illustrated. Okay? Look at how similar that handshake is. That is not something out of nowhere. Okay? If you if you see this handshake, most times than not, it is going to be a Freemason who's going to be giving you the shake. But it just so also happens to be the Knights of Columbus. That's a very interesting thing to consider, isn't it? Okay, as you can see, the last pa uh, two pages are mostly highlighted. Um, why not get started and uh, finally end this book? The Pope himself, our most holy father. You're only supposed to call one father, which is in heaven has given us his apostolic benediction. Wow! If then, which may God forbid, anyone is tempted to reveal our secrets, let him think well before he acts. Such a one would surely incur the curse of God. 
his name would become a byword and a reproach among all honorable men. He would be shunned and cursed by all his former fellows. The conscience of a guilty wretch who has sold his soul would sooner or later come home to him, to chastise him day and night until he made his peace with God and did true penance for his crime. Right? I imagine that penance is going to be in purgatory, right? Uh, Ron, there's no such thing as purgatory. It is impossible to imagine a brother who could be guilty of such an act. He must first become a renegade and an unbeliever and join himself to the forces of the devil. Wow! Who prowls about the world seeking whom he may devour. Really? You know, it's funny. It's like you would think that maybe, I don't know, renouncing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior would probably... Uh, bring upon such a judgment. No, uh, instead it's uh, if you, uh, you know, denounce some sort of boys club. Um, very messed up. He deserves the reception which the devil himself received from God to be cast into eternal torture. Only the infinite mercy of God can save him from such a fate. Think well then, brothers of your act and be ever true knights ready to do and die if necessary for the honor of god and the glory of his holy church <laughs> give me a break and that marks the end of uh of this book um and you know for crying out loud if you're a part of the knights of columbus just get out, okay? What are you doing? Get involved with these types of people. This is nowhere found in scripture, okay? If there's one book you should listen to in this world, it's going to be the Holy Bible, okay? The King James Version, all right? Don't mess with the other ones, okay? If Knights of Columbus has truly changed that much, okay, let's say... That, for all intents and purposes, this is an out-of-date book. Okay? Let's just say that, for argument's sake, you still have secrets. You still have oaths. You still swear allegiance to the Catholic Church. Okay? That's bad enough. Okay? And if this, by your conscience, okay, if this has anything to do with what is being practiced today amongst the Knights of Columbus, okay? Let your conscience eat at you, okay? You're going to have to face God one day, and you're going to have to answer this type of stuff. You're going to look at him face to face, and he's going to say to you, remember what I said to you in Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 to 37? Why didn't you listen to me? And if you come out and say, well, um, you know, uh, they, they said it was about Jesus, it was about you. Uh, uh. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, where, where's your discernment there, buddy? Okay. Wake up. Smell the coffee. Get out of there. Okay, I decided to save a lot of really crucial stuff for the end of this series because I want to be talking about some pretty interesting things. Um, a lot of things that we talked about, yeah, pretty interesting. But then again... I thought I would try to save the best for last. So, KFC and fascism, all right? So, the first paragraph is uh, from uh, Days of Our Years by v Pierre Van Passen. Um, it says, For today, Rome considers the fascist regime nearest to its dogmas and interests. We have not merely rev the Reverend Jesuit Father Coughlin praising Mussolini's Italy as a Christian democracy, but Civ Civilita Catolica, house organ of the Jesuits, says quite frankly, fascism is the regime that corresponds most closely to the concept of the Church of Rome. Now, why do I bring up fascism? Okay, why would I bring up this political organization uh, 
when I am talking about the Knights of Columbus? Well, Fashes is a bound bundle of wooden rods, sometimes including an axe, occasionally two axes, with its blade emerging. The Fasces is an Italian symbol that had its origin in the Etruscan civilization and was passed on to ancient Rome, where it symbolized a Roman king's power to punish his subjects, and later a magistrate's power and jurisdiction. During the first half of the 20th century, both the Fasces and the Swastika each symbol having its own unique ancient religious and mythological associations, became heavily identified with the fascist political movement of Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler. During this period, the swastika became deeply stigmatized, but the fascists did not undergo a similar process outside of Italy. That's very interesting. If Benito Mussolini was to represent that axe, right, that central figure, as a fascist movement would be implying, um, what would the uh, fascist uh, fasci uh, symbol represent on the Knights of Columbus uh, it logo? Who would that? Who would be that axe? Uh, it is uh, to demonstrate. A Roman's king power to punish subjects, um, or a magistrate's uh, power and jurisdiction. Um, who is uh, considered one of the last kings of Europe? Uh, there seems to be only uh, a limited few. He even has his own crown, right? Maybe. Oh no, he doesn't have his own crown. Uh yeah, he does. He's going to be given it when uh, when the real guy shows up. The, the the axe is the Pope. Okay, and uh, yes, um, I guess the Antichrist would be uh, somewhat of a fascist, um, making everybody worship uh, the image of the beast. Okay? Okay, you got some examples here of uh, Benito Mussolini um, with the symbol. Okay, you even have a stamp there with uh, Hitler and Mussolini uh, together. You know, the uh, fasciae on the left, you know, and the swastika and the eagle on uh, the right. You see his guards uh, both carrying uh, the, the fasciae. And they're on, uh, on his uh, porch. It's right there for plain as day. Why, why does the Knights of Columbus have a fascist symbol on its crest? And guess what? Here you go, right in the uh, U.S. Congress, um, you have it uh, right there, uh, where you got the Speaker of the House, who is a uh, trained at a uh, Jesuit university, and you got uh, Joe Biden, Mr. Roman Catholic himself, and everybody gave a standing ovation that day when Pope Francis came in to <laughs> greet uh, Congress and give them a warming speech. Right, all dressed in white. Look at him. All right. Well, uh, now since we've gotten this far, uh, I might as well just um, come here and uh, tear down maybe uh, an idol of uh, the Republican side of uh, politics. Um, here is uh, Ronald Reagan. So throughout Ronald Reagan's presidency, he had addressed the Knights of the Knights several times with praise and adoration. Uh, here are a few clips of Reagan giving lip service to the fraternity. Okay, and uh, there's some other interesting additional details I've uh, decided to throw in there. Um, kind of goes uh, back to what we were talking about earlier. So here you go. Present for our warmest Knights of Columbus welcome, the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all and good afternoon. 
There are far too many distinguished members and friends of the Knights of Columbus with you today for me to recognize them all, but permit me to extend my greetings to your excellencies and, of course, to the leader of the Knights of Columbus, my friend, Supreme Knight Virgil Deckett. <laughs> but I want to tell you that I've had a place in my heart for the Knights of Columbus since I was a boy. You see, my father was a knight, and he never missed an opportunity to express his pride in the KFC or join in its efforts on behalf of charity and tolerance. I can still remember when the silent picture, Birth of a Nation, opened in our hometown. Dad told us that the movie portrayed the Ku Klux Klan in a favorable light and that the Reagans were one family that wouldn't be seeing it. Well, even as a boy, I sensed that in taking that stand, my father had done something strong and good, something noble. And you know, to this day, I've never seen that famous movie. Since becoming president, my appreciation for the Knights of Columbus has deepened. You can't sit where I'm sitting now and fail to understand the importance of Americans who give as much to our nation as you do. Last year alone, the Knights donated over $66 million to good causes, provided more than 20 million hours of volunteer community service, responded generously to Operation Care and Share, and contributed a million dollars to the restoration of the Statue of Liberty. Knights of Columbus, for all you've given America, for all the countless acts of charity you've performed to make our land kinder, friendlier, happier, and more humane, I convey to you the thanks of your country. All that you do as Knights of Columbus arises from the fundamental values you hold so dear, your belief in a just and loving God, in the validity of hard work, in the central importance of the family. When I talked about these fundamental values myself during the campaign of 1980, there was a certain amount of questioning, even criticism. And then came the campaign of 1984, and I know you must have been as gratified as I was to hear both sides talking about values like neighborhood and family. But it was the Knights who led the way, stressing the importance of fundamental values long before you were joined by me or any other politician. For this too, well, I thank you, and I think you deserve to give yourselves a hand. The struggle for freedom in Nicaragua, the effort to defend and strengthen the American family, and yes, the fight against abortion, all these find a common basis in our belief in a just and loving God, a God who created humankind in His image. Without the fostering and defense of these values, the Holy Father said when I visited him in Rome, all human advancement is stunted and the very dignity of the human person is endangered. The Pope expressed his fervent hope that the entire structure of American life will rest ever more securely on the strong foundation of moral and spiritual values. Well, let us pray that this should come to pass and let us do what the Knights of Columbus have always been specially good at, let us work to make it so. Thank you all, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for a message that gives Knights of Columbus and their families renewed belief that life and liberty have moral guarantees which are rooted publicly in the kind of private standards, shared concerns, and vigorous spirit of service we have always pledged to our respective countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Supreme Knight Deccant, I thank you for those very generous words. Your Eminence, Cardinal Casaroli, Your Eminences, Excellencies, Reverend Clergy, members of the Knights of Columbus and the guests here today, I want to begin by saying how grateful I am that you've asked me here to participate in the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Knights of Columbus. A few years back when I was a governor, 
I was privileged to be a Chubb Fellow at Yale University, and I was staying just around the corner in those few days from a sturdy-looking stone church where the events that bring us here today first began. It was there in the basement of St. Mary's Church on Hill House Avenue that Father McGivney and a few dedicated parishioners started an organization that would grow beyond any of their imaginings. Today, the spires of a great university can still be seen on the New Haven skyline. But there is another dominant presence, four huge towers of the national headquarters of the Knights of Columbus, uh, a group a group that has grown to over 1.3 million members and comprises the largest Catholic fraternal society in the world. Much as, during the last campaign, I spoke frequently of these crucial values of family, work, neighborhood, religion, and personal freedom. Now, some pundits claim that this was an attempt to appeal to various ethnic or religious voting blocs. I saw it as a simple recognition of the values that most Americans, whatever their ethnic, racial, or religious heritage, hold dear. As the history of the Knights of Columbus has proven, discussions of our basic values are a vital part of our national political dialogue. For it's only in these values, only in the faith that sees beyond the here and now, that we find the rationale for our own daring notions about the inalienable rights of free men and women. This faith in the dignity of the individual under God is the foundation for the whole American political experiment. It is central to our national politics. Our first president put it very well. He said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, Washington said religion and morality are indispensable supports. And incidentally, to those who suggest that the two could be separated, he further pointed out that morality could not really be sustained or widely observed without religion. There can be no freedom without order, and there is no order without virtue. Now, that's a simple enough formulation but it's an insight found not only in the writings of founding fathers like Washington or great political thinkers like Edmund Burke. It is also found in a great part of our Judeo-Christian tradition, notably in the modern encyclicals of Popes Leo XIII and John Paul II. Those subtleties of truth, the belief in the importance of the family, of community and church, the realization that the Western ideas of freedom and democracy spring directly from the Judeo-Christian religious experience are not often publicly discussed. Yet they, every place I go lately, there's an echo. <laughs> they offer eloquent testimony to the appeal of democracy, to the rightness of our support and their desire to resist that tiny cadre of revolutionaries who want to plunge the Salvadoran people into the darkness of godless communist rule. Our foreign policy has changed in one other important way. For many of years, American foreign policy has suffered from a defensive posture, a shyness about the values and beliefs that form the heart of our political consensus and our civilization. Well, we're on the defensive no longer. The Soviet Union has challenged us to open competition in the realm of ideas and values, and we intend to take up that challenge. That is why when I recently spoke to the British Parliament, I called for a worldwide crusade for freedom and a global campaign for democracy. God bless you and thank you very much.
Mr. President, we also want you to know that we support you in your efforts in Central America. Oh, bless you and thank you very much. We, we, we've been invited to many of the workshops and where your staff has always been so cooperative. But, so we're informed and we're convinced that you're on the right track. And uh, we want you, we'll give you the support that you need in that regard. Well, I appreciate your being very much. Mr. President, you should know that the Knights of Columbus was forthcoming with a very special gift to the new Bishop uh, of Bonnie de Bravo in Nicaragua, and this is very helpful and supportive. We owe you a debt mm -hmm. of gratitude for that. You might be interested to know that I made a telephone call to a bishop out in Iowa who had come back from Nicaragua and who had appeared in the press as. Steve, it's very, very clear from a statement that a trained Jesuit priest who escaped from the Jesuit order made his way here to the United States while he was under oath as a Jesuit in his training he was told something the man's name was Alberto Rivera in a in a little magazine it's called the Godfathers put out by Chick Publications Alberto Rivera made a startling statement in which he said there would be a sign given to Jesuits throughout the world when all churches would be taken over by the Jesuit order. This was, and I'll read the statement to you. Okay. It says this, Alberto Rivera, the sign was to be when a president of the United States took his oath of office facing an obelisk. For the first time in U.S. history, the swearing-in ceremonies were moved to the west front of the Capitol and President Reagan faced the Washington Monument. This happened January 20th, 1981. Steve, the Jesuit order was raised up to destroy everything that Protestantism had done, to destroy representative government, to destroy the middle class, but also, Steve, to destroy the voice of protest throughout Protestant churches. In 1984, after 170 years of cutting the ties of U.S. Vatican diplomacy, Ronald Reagan sent an ambassador to the Vatican. The reason why an ambassador had been cut off from Rome in 1867 was because the military commission that tried those who killed Abraham Lincoln were found to be Roman Catholics. And so the U.S. in protest withdrew their ambassador from Rome. Well, 117 years later, 1984, Ronald Reagan sends an ambassador to Rome. If you remember when Ronald Reagan died, sometime within the last few years, there was a high requiem mass that was given for Ronald Reagan. A high requiem mass is only given for those who have done special service for the Roman Catholic Church. Ronald Reagan was honored in his death by Rome. And I think we've seen Clinton, uh, former President Clinton at Mass, and also George Bush at Mass. And I don't think you can be partaking of communion unless you are Roman Catholic. I, do you have any thoughts on that? Steve, I don't think you're allowed to take the communion in the Catholic Church unless you are a Roman Catholic. So we have some closet Catholics. No, no doubt about it. No doubt. The only, the only reason, Steve, that, that Clinton never came out, even though he went to Georgetown, which is the preeminent Jesuit university in Washington, D.C., and the only reason George Bush didn't come out when he, when he made his vow and entered the Order of Skull and Bones at Yale, he had to bow before the leader of Skull and Bones at Yale. He had to bow before somebody who was dressed up like the White Pope, and he had to bow down before a man who was dressed up like the Jesuit general. 
George Bush sold himself when he was at Yale. And the only reason he didn't come right out and say, I'm a Catholic, is because it, it would have upset people and it would have spilled the apple cart. This way he could do, he could do exactly what Rome wanted him to do. And nobody would think twice. You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> you were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go on. I'm sure they are. I don't know. Just... Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories. Tim Russert. The moderator of Meet the Press and NBC's Washington Bureau Chief collapsed and died early this afternoon. Here's some observations and questions about Reagan. So, why would Reagan call the Pope the Holy Father? When Matthew 23 verse 9 says, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Why is Reagan getting all these special opportunities to speak at and for the Knights of Columbus? At the 100th anniversary meeting, there he is as the central guest of honor. The only way to be in the Knights of Columbus is to be a Roman Catholic. Do you really suggest that Reagan would have been able to speak there if he was not already a member? Give me a break. He holds a broad stance on religion, and then quotes George Washington. Washington was a Freemason, and with the parallels of Masonry and their initiations and the Knights of Columbus, uh, along with the Jesuits controlling them both, one can see how this is just another attempt to create an illu the illusion of all roads lead to God, when really it's, it is the Catholics that are just pushing all roads lead to Rome. So Reagan's vice president was George H. Bush, who also went to Yale and was a member of the secret society Skull and Bones. As a part of one of the ceremonies, you have to bow before a man dressed as the white pope and the black pope, i.e. superior general of the Society of Jesus the Jesuits. Why would Reagan select Bush? As there are many controversies with Skull and Bones, plus the fact that secrecy shows a lack of transparency and disclosure to the representative public. Okay? And yes, George W. Bush was also a member of Skull and Bones. Here's a quote from Alberto, uh, Four Horsemen. It says, uh, here is the link today. It is found in the obelisk, which is a four-sided pillar facing the four corners of the earth. At its peak is a pyramid. It represents a combination of both religious and political power worldwide. It appears in Egypt, in the U.S., Washington's Monument, and in the Vatican. To the Jesuits, Masons, and the Illuminati, it secretly stands for one world government. The obelisk is a cult. It represents the sun god Baal. It also represents life through sex. It is a phallic symbol, male organ. Okay. So Dr. Rivera explained that when he was under the extreme oath of the Jesuits, he was told that a secret sign would be given to Jesuits worldwide when the ecumenical movement had successfully wiped out Protestantism in preparation for the signing of a concordant between the Vatican and the U.S. The sign was to be when a president of the U.S. took his oath of office facing an obelisk. For the first time in U.S. history, the swearing-in ceremonies were moved to the West Front of the Capitol and press. Reagan faced the Washington Monument. This happened January 20th, 1981. Was the president aware of this? We don't know. Um, I'm going to just make an inclination here. I think he did know. All right. 
So here's uh, Ronald Na Reagan and uh, Richard Nixon attending the Bohemian Grove, uh, which is a, another secret society um, that meets up in the northern woods of California. Um, I've decided to just include this for, for good measure. Um, here's a clip from one of their ceremonies where they burn an effigy of a child in front of an owl god, Moloch. What Okay, as I said before, I was going to be uh, talking about and even quoting um, the extreme oath of, induct of induction by uh, the Society of Jesus, um, the Jesuits. Now, this is actually found on the uh, congressional record. Um, I might as well not waste any time. I'll, uh, I'll just read what it says. These are the Jesuits, okay? Uh, this is not um, Knights of Columbus, okay? But Jesuits are still very much involved in these things because it is a Catholic fraternity. Um, you got the white pope and you got the black pope. Um, you know, two sides to the same coin. You think that, you know, they don't have influence in the Catholic Church? Well... Okay, let me read it. I, now, in the presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed Michael the Archangel, the Blessed Saint John the Baptist, the Holy Apostle, Apostles Saint Peter and Saint Paul, and all the saints and sacred host of heaven, and to you, my ghostly father, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, Founded by St. Ignatius Loyola in the pontific pontificate of Paul III, and continued to the present, do by the womb of the Virgin, the matrix of God, and that by virtue of the keys of binding and loosing, giving to his holiness by my Savior, Jesus Christ, he hath power to dispose heretical kings, princes, states, commonwealths, and governments, all being illegal without his sacred confirmation, and that they may safely be destroyed." Therefore, to the uttermost of my power will I and will defend this doctrine of his holiness's right and custom against all usurpers of the heretical or Protestant authority, whatever, especially the Lutheran of Germany, 
Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and the now pretended authority and churches of England and Scotland, and branches of the same now established in Ireland and on the con continent of America and elsewhere and all adherents in regard that they be usurped and heretical opposing the sacred mother church of rome i do now renounce and disown any allegiance as do to any heretical king prince or state named protestants or liberals or obedience to any of the laws magistrates or officers okay so I've skipped a couple of paragraphs in order to get to this part because this part is very condemning. I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity present, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, openly against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the walls, in order to annihilate forever their ex execrable race, that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisoned cup, the strangulation cord, the steel of the poignard, or the le leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus. And, uh, yeah, if you're aware of uh, some of the oaths that are made in Freemasonry, um, this uh, this isn't too much of a stretch. Um, considering this is where it really it really comes from, it's very uh, very intense, um, very uh, solemn to read something like this. Okay, additional factors to consider. If the goal of the fraternity was to not get Catholics involved in other fraternities, why make a fraternity? Who is to say that this is not encouraging further involvement in young men's lives to get involved in other fraternities? For those who are trying to leave Catholicism, and yet are still involved with the Knights of Columbus, why should we trust anything you say? Ignore the fact that it incorporated secret initiations and handshakes. There is still room for skepticism if you are getting yourself involved with a club that openly swears allegiance to the Catholic Church the Pope, and Catholic tradition. Although they claim that there are no more secrets, they still make a person swear oaths. This is totally unnecessary, as found in the New Testament. Finally, as demonstrated in America, the Jesuit Review, it talks about how the first three degrees would no longer be a secret, but the article says nothing about the fourth degree not being secret anymore. What is the fourth degree initiation, and what do they make a person do? All right, so I'm going to end off with uh, some Bible passages. Um, and then I'm going to end with a word of prayer. Um, Galatians 2, verse 4, it says, And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have, in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. 
Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And yes, you can see uh, these world leaders. You can see these these people, these highly trusted uh, people in society. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're transformed as the ministers of righteousness even. And even on a local level, um, there can be people that you know that are involved in, in things like this that are not being transparent, that are not telling the truth. And you can trust them. You can say they're your friend. Okay. But are they trying to lead you closer to God? Are they trying to lead you closer to his word? Okay. Are they living righteous standards? Are they asking you to do the same thing or are they bringing down your standards? Okay. Always be on guard. Always be vigilant. Okay. Watch out for false apostles and deceitful workers. If you want to continue in things like this, and you know that it, it has so much confusion in it, it has so much deception, you know what your end is going to be. And I pray that you get out of this. I pray that you repent and leave even something as the Knights of Columbus today. Dear Father, dear Lord, I pray that this message will reach those that are earnestly seeking the truth. Those that know that the deception of the Knights of Columbus is something that may seem even harmless, may even seem innocent and mediocre. But de dear Father, have their eyes be opened. Have them realize that it is a part of an apostate system that does not love your word, that rejects your word, that does not teach the gospel. It, teach, it teaches a false gospel, which is not a gospel at all. Dear Father, I pray that in you they may come to leave this system, even if it's not the Knights of Columbus, even if it's another system, another fraternity. Dear Father, I do pray that this will reach those that need to hear this, who, who no matter who it may be, dear Father. I pray for discernment. I pray for clarity. I pray going forward that your love may be shown to, to those who are lost and that the truth may be known to them, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by you and only you. Dear God, thank you for all that you do, dear Father, and I pray this in your holy name, dear Jesus. Amen.